What's up everybody, Anthony with July's Aquatics and Gardening and welcome back to another video. So today we are not outside in the garden, we are not in the fish room, we are standing in my kitchen and um, I'm getting ready to do a video that you guys have been asking me to do forever. I'm going to be doing a cooking video <laughs> of all things. Today is my 8th year wedding anniversary and so we decided that because of whatever's going on in the world we're going to stay in and make dinner. Um, I can't remember, I think this is the first time in 8 years of marriage that I'm making dinner for our anniversary. You know, normally we go out, make it a whole day, but this year we're just rolling with the punches. Um, so Julian and I um, have known each other for 13 going on 14 years. We pretty much are high school sweethearts and we have been going steady for eight years. A lot of ups and downs, a lot, a lot of great moments. And so I'm looking forward to the rest of my life with this girl and she's really, really amazing. So today what's on the menu is a pan seared veal chop with onion rings and I'm going to do it surf and turf. So there's going to be Chilean sea bass, jumbo, wild caught, golf shrimp. I'm going to be doing a potato, not potato, a corn casserole. And also orange glazed carrots with ginger. I think that's everything. Did I say onion rings? I'm going to be doing onion rings. And it's all going to tie together with a hot pepper bacon jam. So, there's a lot to do. I've got about an hour before the kids wake up, so I'm going to bring you in and let you see what I've got on my island here. I'm going to walk you through each dish individually. So, I'm going to do, and so in order to not make this video extremely long, I'm going to kind of do my mise en place or everything in place on this main video, kind of show you a before and after shot of what everything looks like, and then I'll do individual well, for the sides mainly. I'll do individual videos for the side dishes so that way I can go into more detail and depth on how I create those side dishes. And in this video, we'll focus on the proteins. All right, so let me bring you in a little bit closer, show you what I've got working on here, and then we'll hop right into it. Please make sure that if you're not subscribed to the channel that you go ahead and click that subscription button, turn your notification bell on so that way you never miss an upload. I will be doing more cooking videos going forward, especially as we get into the late summer into the fall months where I don't want to be outside in the sweltering heat I'm gonna be inside doing a lot more projects this so, is my little island that I've got most of the proteins or all the proteins for what I'm gonna be doing today so let me show you what I've got this is my Chilean sea bass it still has the skin on it which I'll be removing these are six ounce portions I had the fishmonger do that for me I've got wild caught jumbo I forget the count golf shrimp that I'm going to be showing you how to very easily peel and devein and then over here I've got my veal chops which I'm going to be Frenching and tying. I did ask them to French these for me they didn't do a very good job as you can see but I'm going to be completing that process and tying these and I'll explain all that in a minute. Next thing that I do is mix up my salts. Now some people like to mix their salts and their peppers together. I'm not one of those people. I use a combination of three salts and I'm doing this and kosher salt is not one of them. I used flaked sea salt and that's the brand. It's Malden salt. I love, love, love this salt. Sometimes I use it in place of kosher salt but this is my next best salt. After that, I use gray salt, and I think this is French. Uh, this is the bottle that I use. This is a brand I use. I've had this bottle for years, almost since we've got married, and I keep using it, and I love it. The last salt that I use, which is almost finished, is Fleur de Sel, and Fleur de Sel is honestly more of a finishing salt. However, I love it so much that I use it in these kinds of applications. So I get out my measuring spoon and the first salt that I go in with is my flaked sea salt. I'm going to put in two teaspoons and more than likely I'm going to have to mix up more. One, two. 
two teaspoons of you know what yeah I'm gonna mix up more I'm just gonna double it and as you can see that hole at the bottom of the box there so that's four teaspoons of my flake salt to that two heaping teaspoons of the gray salt and you can kind of see what the gray salt looks like there it's actually gray and I love this stuff and it doesn't taste salty it's more briny than anything else I should have given you a close-up of the flake salt but you'll be able to see it when I um, mix it together and the last salt that I have is a teaspoon and a half of my fleur de sel and you can just see the texture of the salt there it's really really fine and again it doesn't taste briny it's just salty and I'm gonna use a teaspoon and a half of that well it doesn't taste salty it's just briny it tastes like the ocean really really good there is my salt let's clean up the board clean board clean chef and that's one thing mom taught me when I was learning how to cook always cook and clean at the same time and I must 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 attribute a lot of what I know about cooking if not all to my mom so wash your meat pat it dry and then what I'm gonna do while it's still on the paper towel is finish Frenching the the cutlet and what Frenching is is just taking off the fat off of the bone here and making it extremely clean and visible and for that, I'm going to use this boning knife. It's not really that flexible, but it gets the job done. So what you want to do is just cut the meat like this, go in at the very end, and scrape that bone. Just like that. I hope you can see. I'm not that great at setting up camera angles yet. But you really want to clean, clean that bone. So you can see, I'm getting right down to the bone and taking all of that cartilage off. Totally all gone. Right. So that is French. So you can see there's absolutely no meat left on that bone. So when you're done Frenching it, the next thing that you want to do is tie it and the purpose of tying it is so, so so you can see if I cook it like that it's just gonna be all over the place and it's gonna be uneven in its cooking time so by tying it I'm gonna bring the package together like this gosh gonna bring the package together like this and so it'll have the even thickness all the way throughout the the entire cutlet and that way it'll cook more evenly all right so standing the cutlet up I'm going to wrap the twine around that bone once, pulling it tight, and I'm leaving a little tail here. Hope you can see that. And then I'm going to go around the back side of the cutlet like so at least twice, like so. Okay? and then back to where my tail is around the bone I'm gonna meet those two ends and pull it nice and taut so you can see it goes from this which is kinda all over the place to this which is neat it's refined it's elegant it's elevated so I'm gonna do that same process with this second cut so now that our chops have been Frenched and tied we're gonna season and so I'm gonna just take a pinch of my seasoning sprinkle it on and get it pushed into the meat now if you can see as you can see not if <laughs> As you can see, I'm putting the salt onto this chops and I'm pressing it in. And then whatever salt falls onto the plate, I'm taking up my chop and I'm seasoning around the edges of my steak also. 
And I'm going to do the same thing with my pepper. I'm not going to use as much, but I'm going to follow the same procedures. So I'm going to get these covered in plastic and put them in my fridge and let them sit in there for about an hour. Then I'll take them out, let them rest on top of the counter for about half an hour before we sear them off. So what you want to do in order to remove the skin from your fish is you want to just lift up a little bit of the end and you're going to peel it towards you very carefully. So angle the knife upward toward the skin, not downward toward the flesh. Wrap it over and gently, gently pull your knife to up and towards you. So that way you're not tearing into the flesh of the sea bass. And there's your portion. Again, find a part of the skin that you can peel up. Maybe this one will come off all the way, but no, it won't. Find a portion of the skin that you can peel up. Put your knife in and angle it upward ever so slightly. Fold the fish skin back. Gently, gently pull it up and towards you and that skin will fly right off. Again, we're gonna wash our fish and we're gonna pat it dry. Now, I'm not going to season this fish right now because with sea bass and with halibut and other types of fish that are delicate, flaky, and white, if you season it too far in advance, what'll happen is the salt will pull out a lot of the moisture out of the fish and it'll become dry. So I'm just gonna set it aside. It's washed, it's prepped. About 10 minutes before we sear it, we're gonna season it only with salt. And I'll explain why when we get to that part of the video. So I'm gonna put this in the fridge. Cover, cover it and put it in the fridge. Last thing we wanna work on are our shrimp. All right, so. My camera angles are really weird today, but I'm doing my best. So I've got my shrimp all washed and cleaned, uh, and I'm gonna season it very lightly. They absorb flavors like a sponge, and you don't want salty shrimp. So that's just my salt and pepper, the same salt and pepper I've been using this whole time, and I've got a lemon that I'm gonna zest with my little zester. I also have one of these doohickeys, which is a rasp, which is the best thing to use for this. But I normally only take out my microplane or rasp when I have a lot of zesting to do. And today is not the day for microplane. Woo! That was a lot of noise. So again, you know how to zest the lemon. If you don't know what you do, you just take off the, the yellow and don't touch the white. And I'm zesting over the bowl so that way I get all the oils and all that good stuff into the bowl. So that salt, pepper, zest of half of a lemon, and also I'm gonna add in uh, about a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes. And this is just my grocery store standard generic brand of red pepper flake. Next thing I'm gonna put in is some extra virgin olive oil. About two tablespoons of that. And it'll help keep the shrimp nice and moist. And that's it. And uh, I do typically squeeze some of the lemon juice into here. You know what, I'm gonna add some thyme. I'm feeling a little thymey today. I'm going to head out to the garden really quick and clip me some of that fresh thyme from the planter that I did a couple weeks ago. If you didn't see that video, I'll link it up above where I planted thyme with flowers. So I'm just going to clip some thyme and I'll be right back. So here's my thyme from the garden. Uh, I think this is the German thyme. It smells Germany. <laughs> Germany has a... 
a scent. Um, but I'm, as you can see, I'm not chopping it. I don't want this to be too perfume with the time, especially because it's going to be sitting in this for a little while. When you chop an herb, it releases the oils. It bumps up the flavor profile. I want to taste the thyme, but I don't want it to be uh, in my face. So, that's that. Now, typically, when I'm doing these types of things with shrimp, I would add in a anise-flavored liqueur, which is called Pernod. After six years, my plastic wrap it's finally finished. Well, sidebar. I bought this plastic wrap when, no, eight years, seven years. How, no, six years. Six and a half years. I bought this six and a half years ago from my, um, my local restaurant supply store and it just finished. Six years. Anywho, talk about a money saver. Um, typically, I would add Perno per to this, which is an anise flavored liqueur. I'll pop a picture of what it looks like up on the screen. But because my wife is pregnant, if you didn't know, she's pregnant with twin girls. But because she's pregnant, I'm going to leave out the liqueur out of that this time. Um, but typically, I do put that in there. All right, so let's head over to the stove and get cooking. And we'll knock this video out of the park. So the steaks, the Chilean sea bass, have come up slightly to room temperature and I'm going to just season them with salt. And the reason why I'm doing only salt is because when you sear a white fleshed fish like this with pepper, those pepper cor kernels, 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 <laughs> those pepper kernels kind of flat the flesh of the skin, the flesh of the skin. Jeez, why can't I talk? Kind of flick the flesh of the fish. And it doesn't really give it that refined look that we're going for. So we're only going to be adorning the fish with salt. Now, I'm going to be searing off my protein in non-stick skillets. That is the best thing to use in order to safeguard yourself, especially as a beginner from having your protein stick to your pan. You want to make sure that you heat them up until they're literally smoking. So, I have them over high heat and we're going to heat them up until they're literally smoking. At this point in time, you don't want to add any kind of oil. It's best to use peanut oil, vegetable oil, or canola oil, or sunflower seed oil. Olive oil has a lower smoking temperature. So you want to use something that, you know, has a higher smoke point so that way you can sear off your proteins before, you know, you fear burning them. Because my daughter is allergic to peanut oil, we use vegetable oil. And again, we want to wait until we see smoke coming off of our pans before we add any fat to them. That is for a couple of reasons. If you happen to walk away or scroll through social media or get distracted by the kids or whatever, and your pot smokes with oil in it, you're at greater risk to start a fire. So never, ever put fat into the pan until you're ready to start searing. All right? So we're going to wait until these start smoking, and then we're going to get our proteins in and working. So I don't know if you can tell, but there's little wisps of smoke starting to billow out of this pan. So we're going to go ahead and introduce about two tablespoons of oil per pot. And you can tell that the pot is hot because of how loosely the oil flows and kind of shimmers in the pan. Now, two minutes per side for the fish. Once you get the fish in the pot, and you should hear that sizzling noise, once you get your fish in the pan, kind of push it down so that it makes contact with the bottom of the pan. Don't touch your heat. Don't touch the fish. Don't shake the pan. Don't move it. Nothing for two minutes. Same thing with our steaks. No matter what you hear, 
see or smell, do not touch that meat. And again, we're going to sear them off. Three minutes for the steaks, two minutes per side for the fish, and then we're going to get them in the oven. So it's been just about two minutes. And if you look right at the base of that filet, you can begin to see that it is getting a lovely crust. So we're going to get ready to check that one in a few minutes. No, not a few minutes, a few seconds. If we pan over here to our veal, nothing is happening yet. So we're just going to continue to wait. Now I see signs that this is ready to be flipped. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at that crust. Wow. That, that is pretty nice. That is sexy. That's what happens when you leave it alone, you don't touch it, and you allow it to sear. Now it's just about time to flip over our steaks. Gonna give it a quick check. Beautiful. Look at that. Can you see that crust? I'm gonna give that one a couple more seconds before I flip it. But that first one is ready to go. The next thing we're going to do is butter base our chops. So we're going to add in some thyme, and that's fresh from the garden. And on top of the thyme, we're going to put in about two tablespoons of butter. We're going to grab a big old spoon and begin to base. So what you want to do is gently pull the pan back and that fat is being infused with the flavor of the thyme. You can add in garlic and rosemary to this also and it'll be beautiful. So again, we're just throwing that fat over our steaks. Checking mm. for doneness. Now, if you're unsure about the temperature, you can always use a thermometer. But I've cooked so many steaks by now that I can kind of gauge mm, where we are by where we are by touching them. And right now we're about at medium rare. So, we're gonna stick these guys in the oven and let them cruise uh, 350 degrees. I think about mm, seven minutes will get us right where we need to be. So I cook them on top of the stove until about medium rare, sear them to about medium rare. I cook them in the oven to medium well and then I let them rest on top of the stove in this kind of butter bath until they cruise to well done. That's how you get a juicy, well done steak. And here is the final product. We got our onion rings, our roasted shrimp, our orange glazed carrots with ginger, our Chilean sea bass, the veal. <gasps> Look at that corn casserole. And last but not least, we did some popovers. Beautiful. And not to mention, look what mommy did with the table. Absolutely beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful.
Well guys, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video and all of the other videos that are linked down in the description box and in the upper right hand corner. Uh, it's been eight long years. It's been a great ride so far. We're looking forward to the future. Um, so I hope that you'll join us in the next video. <laughs> She's hungry. Bye guys. Alright, let's eat.